thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's always a, a pleasure to be introduced as a slow learner, although I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm looking at a room full of people who've heard me talk before and came back, so I guess we're, <laughs> we've all got a few issues in that respect. Uh, since you have come back, uh, I'm actually speaking on, on two consecutive evenings here, so today I'm going to be weeding and then tomorrow I'm going to be gardening. Uh, <laughs> My topic today is basically those terrible Middle Ages, and so we're uh, all going to celebrate our superiority over the past. Uh, not all of it, mind you. I mean, apparently uh, the distant past was sort of okay. Let's see. Uh, you know, these, these guys apparently were, were reasonably worthy of our company. Uh, these Socrates, Demosthenes, Themistocles, and so on, whoever. They were. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually went to a school where Themistocles was part of our school chant. We didn't win a lot of sports games, I'll tell you. Uh, but um, we're, we're, you know, a lot better than the Middle Ages. They were, they were terrible. People were ignorant and dirty and superstitious and having uh, generally a very, very bad time with dogma ridden, fear haunted, truthless, dirty, and idiotic. Um, or so we'd better hope, because it would be terribly embarrassing if it turned out that our glorious epoch didn't stand that very well compared to, let us say, the 12th century. And when approaching this problem, you know, in theory we know all about the dangers of forgetting our history, right? Uh, we all know some of what Santayana said, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The first part's a little less famous, that when experience is not retained, infancy is perpetual. Though it seems to me that it would explain a lot about the modern world, uh, if taken seriously. Uh, and it is hard to get people to take history seriously. And when I'm teaching even American history, because I will try to explain that the roots of the American Constitution, the American political system, as understood by America's founding fathers, lay in the Middle Ages. This surprises people a lot. If you look at the state seal of Massachusetts from the time of the Revolution, there's a guy with a sword in one hand and a, some kind of document in the other. And if you look at it closely, it says Magna Charta on it. So back then, they felt that they owed something important to the Middle Ages. Uh, but that was then, and this is now, and we're much, much smarter than that. And so. I start with a quotation from Tony Blair's foreign secretary, Robin Cook. This was back at the time of the intervention in Kosovo in 1999. And he said about rumors that there were concentration camps, that practice belongs to the Middle Ages. It does not belong to modern Europe. We are right to fight it. Because, of course, when you think concentration camp, you don't think modern Europe, do you? <laughs> What's going on here? This is really a remarkable statement for him to have made. Uh, he was in charge of British foreign policy. He had an MA with honors uh, in English literature, but from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he started on a PhD. He spent his adult life in public affairs, entering Parliament on his 28th birthday, and he was an MP until he died at age 59. You would think that this man would have heard of Auschwitz. <laughs> You'd think he'd have heard of Stalin and the Gulag. You'd think he'd know about Mao, and you'd think he'd know about Paul Pot, and of course he did know about these things. So how does he say something like this? And in order to understand that, it's very important to realize that whatever may be the roots of this, Cook was not the victim of a blow on the head. He wasn't going around saying stuff like this to people saying, poor Robin, he's been in the sun too long, he needs to go lie down, far from it. The UN War Crimes Tribunal Chief Prosecutor, Carla Del Ponte, in her opening address, accused Slobodan Milosevic of, quote, medieval savagery. And later, British Prime Minister David Cameron called ISIL, quote, medieval monsters. That's the same David Cameron who, thanks to being educated at Eton and Oxford, famously didn't know what Magna Carta meant when asked by David Letterman in 2012, or where there might be exemplars. Actually, Boris Johnson at the time defended him, saying, oh, I'm sure he did know. He was just slumming it. He wanted to seem like a man of the people, and therefore he, uh, he played ignorant. Like the sort of insulting view of the voters. Uh, but the fact is that 
what Robin Cook said, what uh, Madame Del Ponte said, uh, what David Cameron said are very common sentiments. You hear these all the time about the Middle Ages, and people who often seem to have only the haziest idea of when they were uh, or what they were. And I maintain that uh, when you're trying to understand not only history but also contemporary polemics, when someone says something that seems to you to make no sense, you have to kind of rotate it around in your mind and work with it until it makes bad sense. Until it hangs together in a way that you may well be critical of, but you can't criticize it properly until you understand what's wrong with it. And in order to do that, you have to figure out from what angle it doesn't just look incoherent. And uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, today and tomorrow defending the Middle Ages on all kinds of grounds, including there was less paperwork. I guess back then it would have been, it would have been vellum work. Um, didn't have to fill out forms. We do. So um, uh, we, we have this requirement that at the conclusion of the activity, participants will be able to include a whole bunch of fine print there. Uh, many important things are going on here, including understanding non-material knowledge, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of different ethical frameworks, the classical, medieval, and the post-enlightenment, and of course, their relevance to the medical profession. Uh, are we educating physicians who are caring healers or cold technicians? Uh, we have to defend and discern the appropriate use of conscience rights, which will be more for the subject for tomorrow than for today, and outline three ways that the writers Thomas Aquinas, Dandy Alighieri, François Marie Arroy, that's Voltaire, and René Descartes have influenced our view of the suffering, health, and human condition, which I hope somebody else is going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do help on that. Uh, there's also the, the conflict of interest provision here, um, and so I have to tell you that I'm not selling drugs. Um, I don't even think I could stay for a glass of wine, but if I do, I'm, I'm cadging it from the organizer. I'm not, I'm not selling it. Uh, I am selling the Middle Ages, but I don't get paid if you buy them. Uh, and I think there was actually a slide for this, but I lost it, so you know. That's the Middle Ages for you. The library burns and the copy's gone. Um, also, uh, on terms of, there's, a, there's some sort of quality guarantee here, apparently, um, um, which I can only say that if I'm terrible, blame John for inviting me. So my father once told an audience, you can always try and get your money back, but not from me. Um, and you can uh, expose my inadequacies in a survey if there's a spot where it's really out the worst presenter of the whole week, if not, you know, write it in. Uh, that's all you've got. So onward now to the past. And one kind of generic problem with getting people to understand the Middle Ages and, and our relationship to them is a general kind of failure to grasp history. And there's a, a quotation from C.S. Lewis that I may even have showed you last time, but it's, it's a good one, so once a year. You know, it's like re-watching A Christmas Carol. You can do it um, he said that in the mind of the uneducated Englishman, the present occupies almost the whole field of vision. Beyond it, isolated from it, and quite unimportant, is something called the old days, a small comic jungle in which highwaymen, Queen Elizabeth, knights in armor, etc., wander about. Uh, that's no longer the purview of the uneducated Englishman. Everybody gets it now. So we live in an egalitarian period. And he also said when he lectured to RAF audiences during the war, they saw history as a shadowy and unimportant region in which the phantasmal shapes of Roman soldiers, stagecoaches, pirates, knights in armor, highwaymen, etc., moved in a mist. I'd suppose that if my hearers disbelieved the Gospels, they would do so because the Gospels recorded miracles. But my impression is that they disbelieved them simply because they dealt with events that happened a long time ago, that they would be almost as incredulous of the Battle of Actium as of the Resurrection, and for the same reason. So, and I think it is very true that, that getting people to take history seriously is something that happened and that matters and that tells us about the human condition and how we got here is very difficult because they have a bit of a comic opera vision of the whole thing. Uh, and it's complicated in this case because, of course, people have the Monty Python view of the Middle Ages. <laughs> As a time of brutality, stupidity, crude superstition, you know, witch burning and all these kinds of things that we all know they did. And I have to say that although once I found Monty Python very funny, I, I, as I get older I find that their humor doesn't age well for the most part. Um, and one of the reasons why is that it's infested with this kind of ignorant smugness, including about burning witches, you know, if they've done a little homework. 
they don't realize that's a Renaissance thing. It's really not a medieval thing. Uh, you know, there's some about the Middle Ages that I'm not wild about. Well, that's Sir Palamides and the questing beast. It's, it's a load of rubbish. It just is. Um, <laughs> there was this passage from uh, a book on military obligation in medieval England, which I was reading because it was part of my grandfather's library. Um, you know, I came across this passage about Elf Noth, the sheriff, fell with Bishop Leafgar the mustache while campaigning in Wales. And I can imagine an audience saying, I'm good riddance to both. Right? <laughs> That's more than we ever wanted to know about either of them. But, having dealt with some of the comic trivia, uh, it's like this Viking guy from one of the sagas who called Ulf the Unwashed. <laughs> I'm thinking, why would you have to be like to get a reputation for not bathing among Viking raiders? <laughs> That's a, it's a distinction of a sort, I suppose. Uh, but the problem in dealing with the Middle Ages is not just ignorance. I wish it were. It's far more Will Rogers' point about the things people know that ain't so. And particularly that there was a light in antiquity that went out in the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or whatever those things were, and then came back on in the Enlightenment. And that this is a period uh, of, in which the progress of human beings toward perfection, toward you know, the New Jerusalem on this earth, was interrupted. And this is why you get this habit of consigning anything bleak or awful to the Middle Ages, and, and this sort of pseudo-syllogism. This is bleak and awful, the Middle Ages were bleak and awful, therefore this is medieval. Uh, which is not just an undistributed middle, but rests on a false major premise. And I will try to make some sense out of what I just said in a moment, but first I just want to give you some examples, because I have files bulging with them, and if you spend years and years obsessively recording things, you enjoy the thought of having an audience unable to leave while you uh, unload them on them. Uh, and I want to start with one that I think would be uncontroversial in almost any setting other than this particular conference, uh, but contains the seed of the error that I'm trying to uproot over the course of this lecture. Um, it's from somebody called Michael Gove, writing in the uh, Ottawa Citizen. I can't even figure out who he is, because if you Google Michael Gove, you get the current Tory leadership contender and the drug warrior slash coke user. So he's kind of hogged the search results. <laughs> but whoever this guy was, he wrote that even green impulses can be turned into a new religion of nature every bit as opposed to innovation as the medieval Catholic Church. Which is obviously worse than the worst thing ever. And I wonder if you were able to challenge him on this famous opposition to innovation of the medieval Catholic Church, he would growl something about Galileo or, you know, so the Middle Ages went into the 17th century. Um, or he'd just say, well, everybody knows that. Uh, or gesticulate vaguely about bad things whenever they happened. But of course, the Middle Ages was not a period in which innovation was stifled, nor is it a period in which the church opposed innovation. You think of all the things that were invented in the Middle Ages. I mean, the Dark Ages saw hay and the stirrup and the three-field system, which is a pretty big deal. The Middle Ages, among other things, see eyeglasses. We'd kind of be in the dark without that medieval invention, wouldn't we? Uh, really major step forward. Also accurate, weight-driven clocks. Uh, forget the sun, the moon, and the seasons. In the Middle Ages, you actually knew what time it was. And they invented chimneys. And I think about things like chimneys. You say, oh, the chimney's obvious. If I'd been around, I'd have thought of that, you know, in Roman times. But nobody did, you know, and therefore you have to give some credit to the person who went, I am just so tired of this fire smoking in the middle of the hut. I am going to pipe the smoke out of here. Uh, the Romans did have some tubes inside the walls of bakeries, but chimneys only appear in Western Europe in the 12th century. And they are a really major step forward because instead of one fire in a great hall, you can heat individual rooms. And of course that, among other things, contributes to privacy and a space to talk and think. Uh, 
And then, of course, because these castles that they were starting to develop were a little bit damp and drafty sometimes, they started hanging tapestries on walls for insulation. And then, of course, you got the Gothic cathedral. Most amazing architecture. Stone that soars. Beautiful, light, elegant. It fell down sometimes, but you know, that's human beings for you. There's lots of things breaking in the modern world. This is an astonishing aesthetic and engineering breakthrough. The flying buttresses, the devices that went into making these cathedrals. This is not a period that is hostile to innovation or one in which people are crude and clumsy. As someone commented, you pick up a medieval sword, they're light, they're balanced, it fits in your hand. This is a very well-made object. And if you don't like swords because they're used for cutting people's ears off and getting rebuked. The Middle Ages invented polyphonic music. It is right around the time that uh, Saint-Denis is the first uh, building to really incorporate all the elements of what we would call Gothic uh, architecture, and also in Paris. I'm going to talk a lot about England, but let's get the French there to you. Um, you started to get voices weaving harmonies together and musical notation. So you don't have to memorize it. It's an extraordinary innovation. We take it so much for granted. And again, you think, well, if I'd been around in the 1000 AD and it was like, I wish I could write the music down, I'd have gone, hey, I know what to do. Um, but again, it's always easy to be smart after somebody else is smart. These are extraordinary things. And in some ways, sort of the death knell of the Middle Ages, but nevertheless highly significant, the medieval world, AKA Christendom, welcomed the printing press, which the Islamic world did not. The printing press was an innovation, it was haram, they didn't happen. And as you may know, that, that there was that UN report that said that the entire uh, Arab world translates fewer books in a year than Spain does. And again, I'm not trying to knock Spain, but it's not you know the dynamic heart of, of the West in the modern world. Um, there were printing presses by 1500, there were 73 cities in Italy alone that had printing presses, 50 in Germany, 45 in France. The English were a bit slower, but they got there eventually. Opposed to innovation? This, this is just worse than nonsense, because it's the opposite of the truth. And the funny thing about all these all those terrible <coughs> Middle Ages is that very often what people complain about in the Middle Ages is the exact opposite of what they would complain about about the Middle Ages if they actually knew something about it. Um, there was this strange thing where, where people were complaining about, inter about International Women's Day and that um, sometimes, well this is the thing, sometimes women didn't get time off because they were pregnant. And um, this was, was described, I think that's what they're complaining about, it's kind of hard to tell, but they said it was somewhat medieval. Uh, oh, no, it was because they, they, they couldn't work if they were pregnant. So, well, that's medieval. As though the great knock on the Middle Ages is that if a woman got pregnant, they told her, go lie down, don't glean. Like, normally the knock on the Middle Ages is backbreaking labor for everybody, including pregnant women. But here's someone saying that having women stop working because they're pregnant is medieval. Which, which Middle Ages are we in here? Um, and then some Ottawa city councillor complaining about there was going to be a garbage dump and said that it's medieval to dig a hole and throw the trash into it. I said, I thought medieval was the midden heap. I thought in the Middle Ages they piled it up and this was a knock. There's this big dunghill outside the village. They'd say, for heaven's sakes, why didn't they bury it? Instead, someone's saying, well, burying trash is medieval. Well, I, I don't know, because they don't like burying trash. It really is extraordinary. As, uh, <laughs> as Chesterton said, the word medieval is generally used as a term of abuse to be applied especially to things that did not exist in medieval times, such as capitalism, militarism, conscript armies, jingo patriotism, the act of union, the Kaiser, or the censorship of plays. And that's a marvelous list, not only because, of course, none of that's medieval, but because those aren't the things people are calling medieval today. They're just the things they didn't like back in 1922 when he was writing. And so now, you just update it. What do people not like today? They call it medieval. Um, at the Globe and Mail editorial board at one point was, was giving the Harper Tories the knucklebone shampoo over their plan to uh, 
have uh, life without parole for people who killed on-duty police and jail guards and so on, and, uh, and people who killed during sexual assault, kidnapping, or terrorism. And um, the board said that this was a bad idea because it, quote, put the medieval notion of eye for an eye justice back where we, we'd gotten rid of it back in 1976. The medieval concept of eye for an eye justice. And I found myself thinking, now where does that phrase come from again? <laughs> right? You did 900 BC and somewhere in the Middle East? That, that's medieval? Uh, you know, well, whatever, Leviticus, the Song of Roland, you know, it's all that, that swirl of bad things. And then uh, another uh, thing, this was somebody called Simon Kent writing in the Ottawa Sun about um, the kind of punishments that take place in parts of the, uh, of the Muslim world, and particularly uh, death by stoning. And they said it would he said it would possibly be funny if it were a Monty Python movie, almost but not quite. There is no joke to be had in a medieval form of punishment like stoning. So which, which Monty Python movie? I think we're in Life of Brian here, aren't we? Because stoning is another of those Old Testament things. And the Old Testament is separated from the Middle Ages by something on the order of 2,000 years. Um, and apparently, this person also didn't realize that a fundamental goal of Muhammad and um, Islam was to purge Judaism of various corruptions and add-ons, especially Christian polytheism, and get back to 900 BC and get things sorted out. Uh, you know, this is an amazing inability to tell historical periods apart uh, because of this one-size-fits-all insult. The National Post in 2002 said, judges have described conditions in jails holding Canadians awaiting trial as oppressive and, quote, like the Middle Ages. Uh, somebody described conditions on the reserve at Attawapiskat as like something out of medieval times when life was brutish and short. Well, what in Attawapiskat looks medieval? You know, m mobile homes with moldy insulation? Do you remember those from the 10th or 12th century? Um, it, it, dependence on, on government handouts, this weird combination of modern technology and a desperate poverty and lack of, of self-generated economic resources? But it really doesn't matter. There was somebody back when, when Mike Harris was, was the bad guy, who I guess Doug Ford is now the bad guy, um, put on a play uh, that, which got funded by government, of course, um, that was called The Legend of Harrishood. And he said, it comes out of the feeling that the Harris government was taking us back to medieval times and was taken from the poor to give to the rich. I thought Robin could. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, I'm sort of embarrassed for these people, but I'm going to keep pounding on them. Um, here's another one from my old colleague Dan Gardner. Many evil is a word one can't avoid in any discussion of Saudi Arabia. It is, let's be frank, a medieval society run by a medieval regime. You know, that theocracy um, with 5,000 princes and all that oil. Just like France under Philip III. Uh, but, but here's why he says it. It is a land of ignorance, intolerance, and obscenities that have no place in the modern world. And so what's driving this is a conviction that the modern world is a really good place where we've gotten rid of cruelty and brutality, and therefore we're shoving it all back into the midden heap. All of that stuff, ignorance, intolerance, and obscenities are going back to the Middle Ages where I guess they belong. And so, you know, Jeffrey Simpson in the Globe and Mail, and Simpson is this uber pundit, very wise man, revered by the chattering classes. He says, rebuilding Afghanistan was always going to be a Herculean task. The country was medieval in many ways, in the political culture, physical infrastructure, and economy. Really? They had feudalism? Um, what, what, the political culture, the, 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 the parliaments, and so on, what? What does he think he's talking about? Uh, and Islamism, of course, it gets particularly targeted, at least I think by people on the right more than any other. Um, some letter in the Ottawa Citizen uh, about honor killing. Um, 
referred to some twisted medieval code of honor that required girls to be killed for even minor infractions, as though the Middle Ages was notorious, among other things, for doing this. And then there's the burqa. After Oriana Falacci had her famous interview with the Ayatollah Khomeini, she peeled off the chador she'd been obliged to wear and called it a, quote, stupid medieval rag. But it's very hard to look through medieval art and find people in chadors. Because it has nothing to do with the Middle Ages. And yet, Ezra Levant, who was defending a ban on taking the citizen, citizenship oath wearing a burqa, again wrote in the Ottawa Sun, that it's a barbaric medieval cultural custom, which has muscled itself into modern life through the threats of extremist imams. He was defending Jason Kenney and not putting words in his mouth because Kenney himself called the burqa, quote, a medieval tribal custom. And apart from the fact that burqas are not medieval at all, which is a fairly significant objection right off the start, uh, Levant says that the Middle Ages is barbaric, and Kenny says they're tribal. And in fact, these are two things that the Middle Ages very conspicuously are not. But it helps to know something about that. Ezra's a particular offender in this one, by the way. Um, at one point he called the Taliban a medieval serfdom that uses Islam as an excuse. And I, I mean, I've got a lot of complaints about the Taliban. But the idea that they're just pretending to be Muslims isn't really on my list. <laughs> uh, I think that's a very strange thing to say. An excuse for what? To be Islamists? I mean, it's a good excuse, I guess, but it's more like a belief. Um, but again, he's not alone. Stuart Bell, who's an expert on terrorism and somebody who in many respects I, re I have high regard for, in the National Post said the Taliban was a corrupt medieval regime. And again, I don't even think the Taliban were corrupt. I, they were puritanical. I think taking bribes in the Taliban, under the Taliban would be a very, very poor career move. Um, uh, but we just had the first woman ever in Britain convicted of uh, female genital mutilation performed on her three-year-old daughter. Um, and Home Secretary Sajid Javid called it, quote, a medieval practice. I don't think these people have any idea what they, know, what they think they're talking about. Or rather, I do, because it's no good saying it's all just chaos. I want to emphasize that this stuff isn't working, but there's a way it's not working. So um, here's Lisanne Gagnon in La Presse, uh, almost 20 years ago now. Que peut faire les héritiers du siècle des Lumières, la plus belle avancée de l'humanité, face à cette vague de rationalité de l'élan qui constitue un intérêtisme islamiste. Que faire devant ces fous de la sortie du Moyen Âge qui n'aspire qu'à simuler en tuant le plus, plus des innocents possible? So what, can we, what can inheritors of the century of the Enlightenment, the most wonderful advance of mankind, do in the face of this wave of delirious irrationality, which uh, is fundamentalist Islam? What can we do with these idiots of Allah who've come out of the Middle Age and want nothing more than to die and killing the largest number of innocents possible? See, we are the inheritors of the most wonderful advance in human history, and people who aren't like us, therefore, are part of that past from which we have emerged, which must be the Middle Ages, because everybody knows they were before now. This is really what's going on here, I think, more than anything else. And thus you get, uh, you know, critics say the religious schools known as madrasas, of which Pakistan has 10,000, promote a 12th century worldview. Who says that? 12th century Islam was relatively moderate and cosmopolitan. They promote a 7th century worldview. They want us going back to the time of the Prophet. You could Google Muhammad, right? You could find out when he lived. But it's all driven by a couple of assumptions. And the first of them is that all religions are the same, pretty much, and they're all bad and sort of the mental equivalent of a burqa. Probably trying to be in the Guardian about John Paul II's funeral. Mullahs, rabbis, and all the other medieval faiths that increasingly conspire together against modernity. Um, so you can throw in priests. I guess you don't have to say that as the Pope's funeral. You can assume they're going to be priests. But this idea that one of the defining qualities of the Middle Ages, that people are religious and religion is bad. And the second one is that essentially all societies are the same, that we are all on one uniform sociological path. 
and that the difference between the Islamic world and our world is that they got on a bus that left six centuries later than our bus. And therefore, they're six centuries behind us, which puts them sort of in the Middle Ages, since it's smeared all over the calendar. And that's George Jonas. And George Jonas is a wonderful man. I was lucky to count him as a friend, but not a close friend. And uh, uh, when you agree with him, his writing was wonderful, but he had a habit of saying stuff like this. Christendom has come a fair distance since the Crusades. Fundamentalist Islam has not. By the definition of the Dark Ages, those who are not of our faith are infidels, and infidels are the enemies of God. Now again, someone at the back of the class, my darn, my Crusades weren't in the Dark Ages. Uh, but you know, um, it's then, and this is now, and that was bad, and we're good. And I put up that thing about barbarism, so I'm going to quote Chesterton because I can't talk for five minutes without quoting Chesterton. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Um, okay, I'm not going to quote Chesterton. Well, not on the screen. Um, he said that Catholics, having some humility even in their hatred, never did make this absurd pretense that paganism was barbaric, as, its en as their enemies afterwards made the absurd pretense that Catholic Catholicism was barbaric. Catholicism, medieval Catholicism was not barbaric. There could be objections to it, theological, cultural. You could have a whole bunch of complaints, but the idea that it was barbaric is just mixing things together just because you don't like them. And you see, if you can convince yourself that all religions are the same, and that all societies are the same, and our only problem is that some of the people who are causing a lot of trouble right now are still waiting to come round the bend and up through the 17th and 18th to the 20th centuries, all we really have to do is sit around and wait. We don't have a big problem. History will get them where they need to be. And that's what the Chesterton quote I do, quotation I do have lined up. He says, the whole theory of progress is the chief obstacle to our progressing. It does not stir people into an, any very bustling activity on the staircase to tell them it is a moving staircase. But this is very much this metaphor that progress is inevitable and kind of mechanical. Um, it doesn't much matter what people think. Uh, and therefore, any problems that may appear to exist, any clash of civilizations you think you're seeing out there, is an illusion. It's just that their bus hasn't got to where our bus is yet. And Tariq Fata at one point said, it's time NATO and the US left Afghanistan to its own demons. Let it find its own way out of the 12th century and into the 21st. I don't quite know why, why the 12th century is getting such a pounding. I think people maybe are, are pretty sure that was the Middle Ages, right? They're not, they're worried about the 10th or the 14th, but young the 12th. You know, so the, this, this is the, um, the medieval Renaissance. This is the high period of architecture and scholarship and creativity. The, Crops are growing, everything is good, it's warm for one thing. Um, but it, it, again, it has nothing to do with where Islam is or where Islam wants to be or where Islam started. Uh, but again, poor uh, George Jonas telling a friend um, who asked him if the terrorists on 9 11 were mad, or, or people burning the building in Beirut because of the Danish cartoons. And, uh, and he said, No, only differently saying, I suggested. They're saying in a manner suitable to their times. What do you mean their times? Muslims live in the 21st century, same as you and I. And Jonas said, some do. Others have bought a pied and they have in the 21st century and commute between it and their home in the 12th century. So once again, it's, it's the 12th century. You know, it's when they built that cathedral. Is that what's going on? Is, that, is this the problem here? Well, apparently so. Um, and... On and on it goes. It's just, it's amazing how much of this stuff I have that you don't want to hear all of. Um, but again, here is uh, Jonathan Kay in the National Post saying that um, the world now knows that the violent tendencies and medieval worldview that animate Hamas lie just below the surface in many other parts of the Muslim world. And so if, you, if you were to look at the medieval worldview and scholasticism and Catholicism and its beliefs about politics and the human being, and then you were to go to a bunch of Hamas theorists and say, I have this kind of quiz, I wonder how many of these things you believe. You know, they go over 10 or over 20 or however many things you've listed. They know what they think and they're not shy about telling you. And they, they publish manifestos and all kinds of stuff and they tell you exactly what they think. And Jonathan Kay has looked at some of it but hasn't gotten through the filter. And here's another indication of the, of the bus theory and how problematic it is. 
Uh, the National Post, for which I write, and which is a splendid newspaper despite its occasional lapses, for all I know Jonathan Kay wrote this, uh, uh, said, Islam is in dire need of a reformation of the kind Christianity underwent in the 16th century. Now, in the 16th century, as some of you may have some idea, um, the Reformation challenged the unity of medieval Christianity under a very hierarchical church headed by a pope. You don't need that, right? <laughs> but, he, but they didn't, because Islam has no pope. Islam is extremely decentralized. It's so decentralized that when the Ayatollah Khomeini died, having declared a fatwa against Salman Rushdie, there was no way to get it lifted. Basically, they said, well, you know, we have to wait till he dies or someone kills him, um, which is cool with us. There's no church structure. There's nobody issuing doctrine that must be believed by the faithful. There's nothing about the medieval church. This only makes sense if you believe in this theory that all societies are on the same trajectory. And they went out because they were talking about some very strange court cases. These are hallmarks of a morally primitive society. No truly civilized people blames the victim for the rape, which was one of the court cases, or whip school teachers for a minor cultural misunderstanding. And then they say the reassurances of governments that they were just kidding about this, which were in fact lies, will be unnecessary only once Muslims embark on the kind of wholesale reformation that Christendom undertook centuries ago. Until then, traditional Muslim nations and anyone who visits them will continue to be at risk of the type of barbarism, mob fanaticism, and absurd dogmas that are on display in those episodes. So there's the Middle Ages for you. Barbarism, mob fanaticism, and absurd dogmas. This is the smug, superior view that we have. And as a result of this, people say the oddest things. Um, for instance, this whole idea about um, iconoclasm, right? And, the, and the, the fact that among the Taliban, among others, believe in destroying anything that could possibly be a graven image. And then in order to show that we're all in this together, in a piece called The Taliban is a Time Machine, which is pretty much, you know, <laughs> there you have it all, uh, George Jonas notes that in the 16th century, Pope Paul III issued his Index Librorum Prohibitorum, followed by the Index Autorum et Librorum, which banned books and authors suspected of heresy. In the Renaissance, and it has nothing to do with destroying icons. It's completely off topic. But it's so pervasive that at one point, um, Mohammed Harkat, who got himself in a lot of trouble with the Canadian legal system because we thought he was an Islamist terrorist, or at least might well be one, said that our, our security certificate regime is a, quote, medieval system. So we call him medieval. He calls us medieval. Nobody has any idea what they're talking about. Um, and then Iran's Revolutionary Guard called Saud denounced what they called Saudi Arabia's, quote, medieval act of savagery. And excuse me, this is not the Arabians are calling the Saudis medieval. It's, a, it's an insult that stings. <laughs> but it really shouldn't, and it shouldn't in part because of the fact that, as with the witch burning, it is hidden in plain sight that the things we are complaining about in the Middle Ages are actually features of modernity, like Robin Cook and his concentration camps that we are projecting, or something like that. We are trying to dump our rubbish on these four people who had nothing much to do with it. You know, the, uh, the witch trials erupt in the 15th century and really get going in the 16th century. The Lutherans and Calvinists were far greater witch hunters than the uh, Catholics ever were, although I don't know why, if it's all predestination, what does that matter? I will screw something up. Some of you know I have this thing about predestination, but I'm... But you can't be mad at me because I was predestined to have it. Um, you know, and the, it, it's 1484 when Innocent VIII issues this bull which authorizes inquisitors to stamp out witchcraft in Germany. That's why you get the Malleus Maleficarum and so on. That's all Renaissance. This is when the light went back on. The light was a burning witch. Sort of awkward. Um, and it went on and on. Um, apparently the 17th century is the worst period for witch burning all over Europe, and um, the last judicial execution of witches in England was apparently a woman and her nine-year-old daughter in 1716, which is a lot of things, but it's not medieval. And it should also be noted, and speaking of the 12th century, let's hear it for the 12th century, that it was in the 12th century that of all people, 
Catholic clerics really took aim at this whole trial by ordeal thing and more or less got rid of it on the grounds that it was stupid and superstitious. And when people are looking at history, people think the Middle Ages, among other things, was dirty and smelly and everybody's teeth fell out. But um, in fact, as one person wrote, the stupefying level of filth accepted as normal from the Middle Ages through the Enlightenment was augmented horribly by the Industrial Revolution. Right, the 18th and 19th centuries see conditions in cities that medieval people would have recoiled from in horror. We said, isn't our civilization great? They just said, no, it smells terrible, it stinks. People are really sickly, what's the matter with you? Um, and in this regard, I was thinking, in fact, about teeth. Because if you ever defend the Middle Ages, people say, yeah, what about dentistry, man? You'd look pretty stupid without teeth. And I've always thought this is odd, because these people are very often materialists, right? They're big, evolution explains everything kind of types. And so their view is that the evolution to fit for survival of the fittest gave us all teeth that would fall out by the age of 30. So and why not arms that fall off? Like, how, how does that fit? So I went and, you know, did some research, which is to say that I Googled it. And, of course, the results that people in the Middle Ages had pretty good teeth. They practiced dental hygiene. They brushed their teeth. They, they cleaned in between their teeth, which it's hard to get people to do in the modern world. Um, and they had far less tooth decay than people do in the 20th century because they didn't eat as much sugar, right? This mass production of food we shouldn't be eating is quite bad for our teeth. And one of the places, the sources that I found that talked about all this ended up by saying, aren't you glad you didn't live back then? But, but you just have people with healthy teeth. And of course they had healthy teeth, right? Like you've you, you got to eat. You know, if evolution works, it, it works on your teeth as it does on other parts of you. And it's like the one horse shea. Everything's meant to go at once. It's no good having a critical system <coughs> fail 40 years before you're meant to fall over because everything else failed. And indeed, somebody did a study of, of male height by looking at skeletons from Northern Europe and found that the average male height fell sharply during the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. People were about, the average man was about five foot eight, uh, would that I could say the same, in the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries, but by the 17th and 18th century, they're down to about five foot five. People are less healthy in the Renaissance, and that's even before you get industrialization and kids crawling around in coal mines and things like that. Um, not until the 20th century do Northern Europeans get back to the height they were in the Middle Ages? Um, and one reason that people did okay in the Middle Ages, of course, is that among the things that the Middle Ages did invent, unlike concentration camps or you know, hip hop, uh, they invented the hospital. That's a pretty impressive thing to invent, especially for barbarians. Why did barbarians they then invent skull splitting as a punishment? Um, <laughs> That was another thing about the Norse sagas, which a guy called something the skull splitter. And again, I remember imagining people saying, well, hey, this is so-and-so the skull splitter. It's like, what kind of name is that? I mean, he split skulls, you split skulls, I split skulls. <laughs> Who doesn't split skulls? What are you calling that for? Um, but the hospital, and again, built on religious foundations, first caring for pilgrims and then spreading out. Um, also universities, maybe they shouldn't have done that, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, you know, by 1350, somebody at the University of Paris is saying, oh, the students attend classes but make no effort to learn anything, while in residence they're sometimes guilty of vices. If they go to church, it's not for worship, but to s see the girls or swap stories. You know? I'm shocked, shocked to find human nature loose among human beings, even in the Middle Ages. Uh, but. Michael Oakeshott at one point it was writing about the, the theory of mass man, you know, the idea that totalitarianism was able to get such a grip on people in the 20th century because they were rootless, that, that the conditions of life, the, the turmoil, the severing of traditional community and, and so on, had left people with no sense of who they were. And um, he quoted, though somewhat skeptically, someone saying that um, in the Middle Ages you knew yourself as a member of a family, a group, a corporation, a church, or a village community or something. Um, for the most part, anonymity prevailed. Individual human character was rarely observed because it was not there to be observed. So mass man gets pitchforked back into the Middle Ages too. I thought of, you know, people like Henry II or Eleanor of Aquitaine or you know, their son John. You know, I'm not recommending his personality, but I'm saying it's hard to argue that he didn't have one. So, so spectacularly loathsome that we still hate him. That's pretty good. 
<laughs> There's other better forms of fame, but you know, he, there was a personality there, all right. And Mass Man brings me back to one of the great calumnies on the Middle Ages. Um, Andrew Cohen, who was a professor of journalism at the University of Ottawa, and again, a, a highly regarded public figure, was writing uh, at one point about the rape of Nan King. So perhaps the least known in the catalog of 20th century atrocities. Japanese troops entered Nanking. Uh, for the next six weeks, they killed, tortured, raped, pillaged, and burned. They wove a tableau of medieval bestiality. Live burials, castration, beheading, bayoneting, particularly babies. Vivisection done for sport. Now, I'm not under any illusions. After a battle, I'm sure some terrible things happen in the Middle Ages, as they always have. But to look at something so ghastly and the technology of the Industrial Revolution put to the cause of slaughtering people in the most hideous ways you can imagine, in service to a divine emperor whose god is going to raise eyebrows, and say it's medieval. That, that, is, that is almost but not quite random. Because very frequently the Middle Ages is referred to as fascist or totalitarian. Uh, Again, so I'm, I'm picking on Ezra Levant, and you might say, well, you know, Ezra's a little bit off the, uh, off the rails. But anyway, under the Taliban, Afghanistan was a medieval fascist state where girls were forbidden to go to school, playing music or shaving the beard was a crime, and the country was a petty dish for the world's terrorists. So where in the Middle Ages was playing music or shaving a beard a crime? <laughs> and, you know, again, and, and people didn't call Ezra on this. They may call him on a bunch of things, not always unjustly, but, but this sort of stuff... You know, it's the, it's the reductio ad Hitler, right? Every, uh, every argument online ends with somebody invoking Hitler for a bad reason, and then they lose. But uh, it is a very, very common accusation. Um, the Ottawa citizen, at one point, called the regime, well, the terrorists generally, um, a medieval totalitarian enemy. But there are no medieval totalitarians. There isn't one. That's a 20th century thing. I mean, Hannah Arendt's seminal work is trying to figure out where did this new and terrible kind of political organization come from? And um, uh, Alan Dershowitz said, well, the Crusades were the prelude to the Holocaust. No, they weren't. You might be able to complain about them. Um, but uh, not on those grounds. And then uh, there's another, uh, this is Tarek Fata again, uh, who's a very courageous opponent of radical Islam, by the way. You know, a guy who's actually, there are people in jail for trying to kill him, right? His death threats aren't just the work of cranks, although they're certainly not the work of sane people. Um, and calling on Israel to exercise restraint after three teens were kidnapped and murdered, he said, killing innocent civilians and collective punishment are medieval practices. Again, I'm not saying nobody killed an innocent civilian or engaged in collective punishment in the Middle Ages, but at least it shocked them. Right? If you want that kind of behavior carried out as deliberate government policy with an unseemly degree of glee, go to the 20th century, because we've got it all. It is quite amazing. But rather than suggesting that we've got us versus them going on in the world, it's very tempting to say it's now versus then. That solves a whole bunch of problems all like at once. And again, um, no, it's poor George Jonas again. Um, but he was talking about the fact that the greatest opponents of radical Islam are other Muslims, including particularly um, immigrants from the Middle East to countries that aren't ruled by radical Islam. He said most immigrants from the Middle East uh, settled in the West because they made a choice for freedom versus tyranny, enlightenment versus the Middle Ages. And there it is in a nutshell. Freedom versus tyranny, enlightenment versus the Middle Ages. Interchangeable terms. Even Benjamin Netanyahu at one point said, as our region descends into medieval barbarism, Israel is the one country that upholds these values common to us and to you. Uh, again, it's just sort of a swirl. And the thing about barbarism, again, Chesterton says that... Um, when people talk this way about the Middle Ages, you'd think that if it weren't for superstition, there would always have been progress. The truth, is, the truth is that, but for what they call superstition, there would simply have been savagery. They assume that Danish pirates would all have wanted to join ethical societies and attend university extension lectures, but for the deplorable obstacles like St. Dunstan. 
and uh, calling it a, a candle in the dark, Chesterton says, one may like or dislike that candle, but it is quite certain that it was only the light in that blue. That what happens in the Dark Ages is that Christian missionaries turn barbarians into civilized people. It is astonishing. Look at England after the wave of these terrible Saxons and Angles and Utes, right? The Utes get no respect. They're being called Jutes, like they were a fiber. Um, but when these people show up at the end of Roman Britain, they're, they're worse than the worst thing ever. They really are awful. They have some ritual called a blood eagle, and I've never dared find out what it was, but I'm very sure it was not the way you wanted to go. Uh, but once they get evangelized, they start writing law codes, and they become the defenders of peace, order, and learning, and the dignity of the individual against, sort of ironically, barbarian invaders swarming across the North Sea with terrible gods and fire and swords. And when the Vikings show up, and all the Saxons are going, this is an outrage, and the Celts and the Wales are going, yeah. We've had that opinion about some other people, too, you know, um, but eventually bygones are bygones. Um, and yet, we continue to get this kind of uh, discussion going. Um, Tasha Kiridan, talking about this picture of a row of girls in the cafeteria at Valley Park Middle School in Toronto. The row is segregated behind a mass of students participating in an Islamic prayer service. The reason the girls are in the back and, and not praying is, wait for it, they have their periods. One is tempted to say, is this the Middle Ages? <laughs> One is tempted to say no such thing. <laughs> and then she says, I've stumbled into a time warp with religious practices that relegate women to the back of the bus. Now, what's back of the bus all about? All right? Uh oh, it's 20th century racial segregation. Not something medieval. It's one of our children. Like that, again, in the Christmas Carol, those two terrible children clinging to the feet of the spirit of Christmas present, right? Racial segregation and laws about blacks going to the back of the bus for. They're ours. We can't wash them off, and we can't just stick them on somebody else. We did that. Um, and, and here it is necessary to point out, and uh, Régine Pernou, who wrote this book, The Terrible Middle Ages, to defend the Middle Ages, from which I stole my title, actually talks about this, about the fact that slavery in the ancient world, let's hear it for the ancient world, disappears in the Middle Ages. And then it comes back in the Renaissance, and it comes back worse than ever. But there's something inventive to make slavery worse by making it racially based. Uh, and what Pernod says is, it is curious when one glances through history textbooks to note the discretion with which this is brought up, whether it is a question of the disappearance of slavery at the very beginning of the High Middle Ages, or of its abrupt reappearance at the beginning of the 16th century, one witnesses a rare restraint on this subject. But it's true, if you're looking at, you know, antiquity, Middle Ages, modern world, you know, well, it's supposed to be like this, right? But when it's slavery, it's like antiquity, Middle Ages, modern world. Because we created a slavery of a sort that left this horrible, lingering after effect, even after abolition, of deep-seated and pernicious racial prejudice, violent and vile. This is not a medieval thing. This is, again, is one of ours, and we must deal with it in our own time. And it's also very interesting to think about the rights of women. Will Durant, at one point, said, classical antiquity conceived virtue in terms of man, just as medieval Christianity conceived it in terms of woman. You know, we all know that we've had progress from women being chattels to women being free and wonderful and, and accepted and so forth and encouraged. But actually, in the Middle Ages, um, Women had considerable rights. Uh, Langland says, you know, that marriage depends on, quote, the father's will and the counsel of friends, and then by their own mutual consent. And in quoting this, the noted medieval scholar Bertie Wilkinson, or to me, Grandpa Bertie, added, Langland lived in a sophisticated age. It's my, my grandfather spends his life in academia, but he was a polemicist through and through. Uh, I come by it honestly. Uh, and uh, Michael Powick, writing about medieval England, says, the personal family of the Lord was at the center of this vast estate. The lady of the household, wife or widow, was a person of great authority. With full legal powers, she would frequently be in sole charge of at least a domestic household, and often, if the Lord was away at war, in counsel of the whole complex barony. It is in the Renaissance, and particularly as Roman law asserts itself everywhere but England, that women's role is increasingly restricted. This isn't meant to be happening because modernity is good and the Middle Ages is bad. 
but it is a fact. It's, you look in the law and you see all this. And despite that, the Ottawa Citizen editorialized about Fallujah in Iraq. The US is a modern industrialized nation that identifies with the Western tradition of human rights and respect for life. The enemy, by contrast, has a medieval mindset that glorifies death. So again, human rights are part of the Western tradition, but the Middle Ages doesn't have them. So the Western tradition misses the Middle Ages. It jumps over it, or it just it goes and hides while all this darkness and fear spreads over the land, and then it comes back. The Italians find it in a trunk in 1450 and go, hey, wow, this is cool. Everybody goes, great, yeah. Let's uh, stop with all that terrible Middle Ages stuff. Um, and I do have to mention, one of the things that really galls me is that we are so much smarter than those dumb medievals that they thought the world was flat. And the weird thing is, the idea that people in the Middle Ages thought the world was flat really only appeared in the 19th century. It isn't even really a Renaissance idea, it's a Victorian idea, because by then we were so much better than them that in order to lift ourselves up, we had to push them down even further. In fact, a man named John Holywood, known in Latin as Sacro Bosco, is from Yorkshire, like my grandfather, um, and wrote three books. He wrote two on math and one on astronomy. And they're not um, adding much to knowledge. He's a popularizer. It's like astronomy for dummies, medieval style, or something along those lines. Um, and in it, he offers proofs that the world is round. He offers several. And all these people in the modern world going, ha, 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 those medieval so stupid they thought the earth was flat. I want to ask them before we proceed, how do you know it's round? Oh, well, that's what they told me. So you're sort of a slave to authority, right? Like you just believe things because someone told you them. Um, whereas in the Middle Ages, they knew the world was round because, among other things, the stars rise and set sooner in eastern than western places. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, you can always see the pole star, but in the south, you can't. Um, and the ships disappear, hull then mast as they go over the horizon. So these are all pieces of evidence that educated medieval people could produce to demonstrate that the world is round. They also weren't expecting a twin in the year 1000, by the way, probably because they didn't have you know, terribly coordinated calendars to have a Y2K panic, you need computers. Um, but of course, we wouldn't do that. Uh, and, and yet, there's this pervasive assumption, Basil Little Hart, a great 20th century writer on strategy, and he says, th this chapter on the Middle Ages serves merely as a link between the cycles of ancient and modern history. In the West during the Middle Ages, the spirit of feudal chivalry was inimical to military art, though the drab stupidity of its military courses lightened by a few bright gleams. And then he goes, well, no fewer perhaps in other times, right? Because the annals of military folly are uh, a vast archive. And then he, he mentions that the Normans in particular put a high value on Norman blood, so they extended brains and substitution for it, and it worked. So he admits that he's actually wrong. But at the same time, he's like the medievals, were, they were too stupid, right? As though if he'd been there, well, those castles would have fallen like that, you know? I'd have, I'd have huffed and puffed and blown them down or something. <laughs> I mean, look, let's face it. You know, defense had a big advantage in the Middle Ages, like the Battle of the Somme. People are always going on about how stupid the generals were. Like, what would you have done? You're so smart. How would you have won the war? Or would you just have surrendered and called it victory? But that's a subject for another day. Um, the point here is that this is a very, very muddled vision of the Middle Ages. Um, again, George Jonas, one more time, a drawing of Muhammad blasphemy? Surely that in itself is crazy. No, not in the 12th century. You know, the creation of craven images along with the pictorial representation of divine or saintly figures used to be highly controversial in Christendom as well. So what's that thing with a little man on it up at the front of the church? <laughs> um, but, but then he, he goes on about the fact that um, the mili Islamic militants are holding up a mirror for us in post-Christendom to see our own 12th century faces. And I wanted to go, have you ever seen a cathedral? Uh, but I don't have to, because again, Régime Pernod. Uh, executions of an almost medieval savagery, one such journalist wrote recently. Let us savor this almost. Of course, in the century of concentration camps, cremation ovens, and the gulag, how can we not be horrified by the savagery of a time when the portal of Rheim or that of Amiens was sculpted? 
And so you get this extraordinary notion of the Middle Ages as having been a period of darkness between two periods of light, which comforts us a lot of the modern world, the expense of forcing us to talk a lot of nonsense, not only about the Middle Ages, but also about the modern world. This idea, Hendrik van Loon, who had wrote this splendidly incorrect, politically incorrect history of mankind back in the 20s, he couldn't get this thing published online today, but um, at one point he talks about the fact that as the economy kind of recovers in the 12th and 13th century, the world was once more filled with divine curiosity. A flood of sunlight entered the dusty rooms and showed inhabitants the cobwebs which had gathered during the long period of semi-darkness. At that moment, the Middle Ages came to an end and a new world began. And or Alexander Pope, I'm a fan of Pope, although his meter gets a little tedious after a while. But learning in Rome, alike an empire grew, and art still followed where her eagles flew. From the same foes at last both felt their doom, and the same age saw daring fall and Rome. With tyranny then superstition joined, as that the body this enslaved the mind. Much was believed, but little understood, and to be dull was construed to be good. A second deluge learning thus all around, and the monks finished what the Goths began. At length Erasmus, that great injured name, the glory of the priesthood and the shame, stemmed the wild torrent of a barbarous age and drove those holy vandals off the stage. <coughs> because the villain is tyranny and superstition. The villain is religious faith. Because when you look at antiquity, <coughs> pardon me, They've got the Olympians, right? They've got Zeus and these stories about swans and so on. Really believe that stuff. Um, uh, there's one one conversation between two Romans about well, one saying, well, you know, what do you, what do you really think about the gods? And the other guy says, I'm exactly like you. In public, I believe in all of them. In private, I believe in none of them. And somebody, again, I'm sorry, I did not look this up, but it might even be Hesiod, complains, he says, the Olympians have every vice you could possibly imagine. These are not role models. And in fact, when, when people will sometimes say to me, you know, you realize that man just made God in his own image, right? We, we invented the whole thing. My answer is, if we made God in our own image, he'd be Zeus. That's what we'd look like if we were immortal and omnipotent. <laughs> we'd be lustful, drunken, unreasonable, petty, vindictive, We'd sit up in heaven gossiping, gobbling, and feuding, right? That's, there's man, God in the image of man. Um, and for all the wonders of Greek philosophy and of the Roman sort of plotting and systematic approach to it all, there's, there's no theology. There's really, I mean, where do the Titans come from? Where did creation come from? There's, there's, there's no there there. And then, of course, you get into the Middle Ages, and you get people who start to take ideas about God and creation and the purpose of human life very, very seriously. And with the Renaissance, you start to get the corrosion that eventually you just suppose moderns. And so if you want to find one thing that does unite antiquity and the modern world, it's that people are not living with an eye to salvation and the thought that there is a creator who is all-powerful and just, but also, thank goodness, merciful. And so that's the real knock on the Middle Ages, that uh, the monks finished what the Goths began, that because we had religious belief, we were stupid, on purpose stupid, not like, oops, we're dumb, or, oh dear, we're malnourished, but like, we're doing this to ourselves on purpose. And uh, I'm going to skip over, because. You know, I don't want to try your patience any more than I already did, but there's a bunch of people who can't tell the Dark Ages from the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, one letter writer blasting my former citizen colleague David Warren uh, on the subject of evolution wrote, since we came out of the Dark Ages of superstition and rigid religious dogma, science and God have coexisted quite happily. But this is, again, the, the medieval church was not opposed to science. It wasn't opposed to people looking at how things worked. It wasn't afraid they discovered the Bible was false. You know, some people might say they should have worried about that, but they certainly didn't worry about it. Um, science has its roots in the Middle Ages, like so much that we now value, including many things that seem to me to have sawed off the branch they were sitting on by the 20th century. Uh, but the idea here is that there was rigid dogma. 
that scholasticism isn't an attempt to think through interesting problems. It's an attempt to stop anybody from thinking with a set of pat answers to everything, uh, which can be snarled at peasants and are in fact incomprehensible. And uh, I've got a couple of quotes I'm skipping because I really am trying to spare you the full uh, marathon here. But Walter Badgett, writing in the 19th century, and you know, politics and physics and politics are revealing sort of materialist <coughs> title about how it's all a machine, saying it's because of the analogy between the controversies of classical Greece and those of our times that someone has said classical history is a part of modern history, it is medieval history only which is ancient. And so thus you get history as a steady story of progress by sawing out the middle part and putting it at the beginning. Everything is terrible, then everything is better, and now everything is great. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mentioned my, my grandfather uh, who I had children fairly late in my visit with my parents, so I, I only knew him as quite an old man. And it wasn't until after he passed on that I actually read his writings and started to discover that there was a kindred spirit there in many ways. And I, at one point, was interviewing somebody at the University of Toronto on an unrelated topic, but it turned out that his dissertation advisor had known my grandfather well and remembered him fondly, including his habit when some stupid thing happened of going, it was better under Clovis. <laughs> and we're talking about it. He, he said this three or four times, and it really struck me that he kept mentioning my grandfather's muttering it was better under Clovis. Um, but I want to leave you with something which is not really mutterable, but is from my grandfather, and perhaps should be set to uh, polyphonic music, and will set the stage for what I want to talk about tomorrow, having, I hope, done something to uproot the weed. This notion that the Middle Ages was a terrible period where we fell into a mire from which we only emerged a thousand years later because we were so torpid and dumb we didn't really know we were in it. What he wrote was this. Today we are perhaps more acutely aware of the continuity of history. Okay, as well, I guess. We value the Middle Ages as providing not so much the foundation as the pattern of our civilization. We appreciate more the underlying identity of our 20th century way of life with that of our medieval predecessors. We have to study the Middle Ages, not merely as a foundation, but for their own sake. They were a period when our own constitutional ideals and traditions, which still continue and without which our civilization cannot live, were simply and vigorously expressed. Now, as I've said, there is much about the 20th century that is appalling and unique to modernity that would have scandalized medieval people. I don't know if, if you ever watched Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, you know. I've, one of my unusual accomplishments in life is that I've seen a lot of movies that people will look at you sideways if you confess to having watched. Um, <laughs> but in that movie, they someone up in a time machine and they bring back very historic figures to the late 20th century and everyone is dazzled and delighted by what they see. And I thought, but was that an unself-aware movie? You bring back people from the past of the 20th century and now the 21st, and they are going to be very, very bothered by a lot that's around us uh, that we somehow just take for granted at the same time that we then just hand it off to the 12th century saying, here, this is disgusting, this must be yours, what's in here? Uh, so there's a lot in the 20th and 21st century and the 19th that is not medieval and is also not good, but there is a great deal of what is important that does come to us in the Middle Ages. And the most obvious example, I mentioned hospitals and universities. The third great invention of the Middle Ages, particularly the Middle Ages in Britain, well, England and Britain, is Parliament. Representative self-government limited, a compact between the people and the rulers in which the people set the limits on what government can do and have effective ways of yanking on the leash if the state gets out of hand. That is a critical medieval gift to us. That is something that you don't find in antiquity. There is much in antiquity that is valuable in terms of, under, of thinking about law and the state and how it ought to be done. But there are some things that are very conspicuously missing in Greece and Rome that appear in the Middle Ages, from down to up, and then disappear from the Renaissance on as political liberty is under siege from European absolutism, from fascism, from communism, from Islamism. There are all kinds of revolts against this system of liberty and limited government grounded in the dignity of the individual. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. 
the fact that, as my grandfather said, the Middle Ages are a period when our own constitutional ideas and traditions, which still continue and without which our civilization cannot live, were simply and vigorously expressed. That is the opposite of the conventional understanding. But I think it is true and it is important. And of course, it is intimately connected with the fact that the Middle Ages was founded on a religion whose God was the truth as well as the way and the life, who gave a guarantee of human dignity and of a comprehensible, orderly, logical, and fair universe, and created an expectation that didn't exist in antiquity and to a large degree does not exist in modernity, but which is the essential foundation in terms of government without which our civilization cannot live. Thank you.